All right, I hope you had a nice lunch, a little break to prepare you for the, for the next speaker. Uh, someone I, I've actually worked with before, and I, I think I learned a lot from you, uh, though our last interaction was probably that you were my boss, which is the last thing I remember. <laughs> it's not the case anymore. Uh, now we're going to learn more about microservices and how they do them at Spotify. So give a warm welcome to Petr Molian. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Per, and thank you, everyone else. Um, so uh, this is talk about modeling microservices. Um, and, and first, a little bit about me. I've been building software since 95. Uh, and at Spotify since uh, 2013, so run, coming up on, on three years now. And at Spotify, I've been working with building various kinds of infrastructure. For instance, uh, Nameless, which is our service discovery solution. Uh, so that's where, you know, if you spin up a service on some machine, then it registers with Nameless and it's then discoverable, so it can take traffic. I'll talk a little bit about that now because it's, it's coming back later in the talk as well. I've also been working with our... Um, uh, drop wizard analog for those of you who are familiar with that. It's called Apollo and we open sourced that uh, in November, I think it was, something, last year. Um, and uh, I have also been working on System Z, which is the, the main topic of this talk. Uh, right now I'm, I'm doing data infrastructure, so collecting uh, events, things that happen in our various systems and then making them available in Hadoop for processing. So the, the talk is divided up into four parts. Um, first, a section with some kind of background about what, what do I mean by, by modeling microservices? Why do you want to do that? Uh, what are the problems we're trying to solve? And then uh, a description like of what, what does this, our solution look like? And then how did we design it? And you know, a, a very brief sort of conclusions and, and what's, what's been the impact so far. I hope that, that you guys will learn something about running microservices at scale, you know, whatever that means. So, um, um, and, and when, when I say scale, um, I like the scale cube from a book called The Art of Scal Scalability. Um, and there they, they sort of divide up the way that you scale things uh, according to different axes. So uh, typically, I guess, the first thing that you do is when you have, if you have a single web server and a database, then when the web server can't handle it anymore, you split it so you have like two clones, two, equally, uh, two, two identical copies, and then you can have, you know, add more and more of those. So that's the, the x-axis x scaling, more copies of the same thing. Uh, along the z-axis, you have sharding. So when the user database can't handle the load anymore, then you split it up and you say, all users uh, whose IDs end with zero in this one, in one in this one, and so on. So you shard it up using some sort of algorithm. Um, and then uh, the y-axis is when you split uh, a system up into different components. So rather than having copies of the same thing, you say, here's the login thing, and it does one thing, and I scale it in one way. And here's the uh, uh, search thing, and it's something else. So you, you have you know, more copies of, of different kinds of things. Um, and, and what happens is when, um, you know, at Spotify at least, like we don't do much uh, sharding ourselves. We, there's a, one place I know of that we do that, but generally we sort of leave that to tools like Cassandra and things that, that manage our data. We don't do it manually. But we do do both of the X and Y axis scaling. And when you, when you move out on these axes, uh, then you know, even though every single thing you have uh, is, is simple, then the interactions between them bec may become quite complex, and you have a, you get a complex system like that. So, uh, to give some numbers, um, at uh, we have you know something like ten thousand uh, servers in our in our data centers, and on the y-axis we have about eleven hundred different things. You know, I'm going to talk more about what I mean by a thing. Uh, it's not exactly a microservice; it's slightly different. And I think another point that's, that's you know, uh, equally relevant for, for, for this talk uh, is that we have about 100 teams that write code. So that's another aspect of scaling. You scale it, scaling your development organization, and that also leads to a need for information of the kind that, that this talk is about. Uh, and I'm not sure, but I think maybe I'm going to talk a little bit about how teams work at Spotify. 
And the reason is, I think, maybe, maybe the way we're organized is like uh, adding to this, this need for, for, um, for your metadata. And this is uh, a couple of slides that I've stolen from another talk, which shows that you know, we have um, uh, squads. We call them squads. It's a squad is a, a group of you know, seven plus minus two people, uh, and they own something end to end. So uh, there's a, a squad that owns the search function at Spotify. That means that they own uh, the user interface, so on all of the clients, so for Android and iOS and whatever. Uh, they own the backend services that do it, and they own uh, the quality of it, so they do the testing themselves, and they own the uh, operational responsibility for it. End-to-end, -end, full ownership. They also decide what changes are made to, to the search feature, so they own the, the, the product development as well. Uh, and then we have, so we have, you know, that, that's a, an example of a feature squad. Uh, and besides, we have other kinds of squads, so infrastructure squads that builds things like System Z, that's built by an infrastructure squad. It's a tool for the feature squads. And uh, the client platform squads, which also build other kinds of tools for, for feature developers. Um, <coughs> we also, this, this is also sort of, Spotify has, has a history of, of growing very quickly, uh, doubling the number of, of developers every year up until a year and a half ago, and now again uh, growing. Uh, and we've done that basically through cell division. So a, a squad, you add people to a squad, it becomes too big, you split it into two, and they get different things to own. Um, the squads are, are autonomous, I mentioned that. They make, their own, make up their own minds about what they're going to be building. Uh, and that means that there's no, or very little at least, like formal or enforced communication between squads. So, so squads... Um, don't necessarily communicate with other squads about the decisions they make. It has, you know, the, the, the good thing obviously about that is that uh, you get quick decision making. The, the bad thing is you get, uh, you, you solve the same problem in different ways in different parts of the organization. It's a trade-off. I, I think it's a good one. Um, but it does mean that, that you have some, some extra complexity when you want to understand what all of the squads do together. And there's a uh, a link there to uh, uh, a video uh, that I think is really interesting, and, and you should, uh, if you haven't watched it, I, I would recommend it because it's, um, it's a nice video by, by Henrik Kniebay talking about these things. So, like the, the scaling up on the X and, and Y axes, especially, and the way that we work together, the fact that we have 100 squads that don't necessarily talk so much, leads to a, a bunch of problems when you, that, that we need to solve. So. Um, and, and they're very much about, you know, understanding and discovering like, what, what, is this, what is the system that we have? What are these 1,100 things that we have? Uh, where are they deployed? Like, if I, if I own a service, like, do I know that it's running where I think it should be? How do I know? How do I find out? Uh, and the system as a whole, like, how does it fit together? If, if there are 1,100 things out there, how do they call each other? How, what's the, the, the graph of, or the web of, of interactions? Uh, and how, how do I find out more? If I need to, you know, I, I want to call this thing because I want to get data about something, uh, how do I find out to, how to use it? Like, I need to understand maybe, uh, or if I want to have a feature added to it. Like, so ownership is, is one of the, the key things that, that's hard. Um, and also, like, if something is broken, what is it? And, and how do I fix it? Or how do I get somebody to fix it? So, so taken together, these things lead to a, a need for, for systems uh, metadata, and that's uh, what we have in what we call system Z. So that's, that's um, uh, about the background. I can't see any of you, so I, I don't know if there's understanding in your faces or, or just confusion. I'm hoping for understanding, but I don't know. <laughs> um, right, so next section, let's talk a little bit about how we uh, what we've done, like how it works from the uh, surface. But before that, let's start with what we had before systems had. We had Emil. Emil is uh, the operations director at Spotify, uh, and and he uh, he labels his his reign as the systems metadata system as uh, rumor driven development. <coughs> Basically, you know. Uh, when when, when uh, Spotify was smaller, both in terms of the number of teams and in the num terms of number of the, the number of, of 
microservices we had, it was possible for one or, or a couple of people to know, like, uh, I, I want to do this. Okay, you should. You need to call this service, and if you want to find out, then talk to this squad. And eventually, the the growth was such that you know it, it wasn't possible for a person to to keep up with it anymore. So then we introduced something called Service DB, uh, which. Uh, you know, had, had, this, had this responsibility of understanding, like, it's a database about our services, so it should have all the metadata about our services. It didn't receive um, enough love uh, because there was, you know, lack of ownership of it and, and things. So I think it's about a year and a half ago that we made the plans very concrete to actually build System Z. JP? Yes, no? Yes. So, System Z. Uh, third generation systems, metadata system. Uh, <coughs> so the, the front page looks like that. It's not very exciting, uh, especially not in this big room. If you want to look at the slides later on, you'll see what's in there. It's also not very exciting. Um, the, the name System Z has a story that I, I like a little bit, because when we set out to build this thing, we, we didn't know exactly what it was. Uh, it wasn't service DB, it was something else. Uh, but, and before we knew what it was, we didn't want to give it a name. So we came up with a, a, a really poor name that we knew we were going to change later on, and that was System Z. And here we are. <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's perfectly okay. Like I was one of the people voting in favor of actually keeping System Z as a name after a while, because we tried to think of something else that was better, more descriptive. But uh, as you will see in the, in the coming slides, it's actually doing a really wide set of things, and it's really hard to have an, uh, an accurate name for it. So uh, System Z, it's, it's become, it, these names become like, you know, proper names, so uh, they, they become a thing of their own, and it's okay that it, it's, it's not a descriptive name. So I think it works. Mm. Right. Okay, so... Uh, <coughs> Some, some terminology um, illustrated by, by this architecture diagram of a nameless service discovery system. That, that's a diagram that I actually drew uh, about two and a half years ago, I think, uh, when we were building this. Uh, and it shows the, you know, two of the main things that we have and, and some of the, the concepts that we have. And I think it's, well, I guess it's not surprising because we were using nameless as one of the things that we were modeling systems at around, but still it fits nicely. Um, so we have, you know, components, which is something, sort of unspecified what, something we want to track, we, that we want to keep metadata about, and, and kinds of components that we have in systems that right now are microservices, obviously, that's the, the most frequent kind, data stores, also kind of common, so like a Cassandra database or Postgres or whatever, uh, a p data pipeline, which is uh, a, a job in Hadoop or a set of jobs in Hadoop that, that pr produce some data, or a library. Uh, and a system is, you know, a collection of things uh, that, that belong together. So the, the diagram, you can probably not read it, it's okay, uh, but the blue box is like nameless, the system, and it consists of uh, the, the four yellow boxes and the, the, the gray data store, like, so those are components in the system, and they're, you know, different kinds. The data store is a Cassandra database, uh, the power DNS thing in the top left corner is a, a, a DNS server, and the other ones are, are two Java services and uh, a set of command line tools. So um, the terms are kind of, kind of vague, and, and m a lot of things are vague or you know, imprecise here. And that's um, intentional because um, the fact that you know, we have uh, autonomous squads leads to different solutions for similar problems. So we don't, have, like, we don't enforce standards. People solve problems in slightly different ways. We want to be able to fit. Uh, to have a model that, that can, can handle that. Plus, um, the fact that uh, when uh, infrastructure technology evolves, not, it's not necessarily the case that all of the uh, services and things that are out there actually keep up to pace or keep, uh, keep up with the, that involvement. So we have you know, uh, a lot of different versions of, of things that are out there in our, in our ecosystem. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Oh yeah, one more thing. Um, <coughs> you can see uh, two arrows that are incoming here, and that's you know 
things that can be called from the outside, outside of the, the nameless system. And that's uh, a concept that's coming back a little bit later. It's so, so say the nameless discovery component, I don't know if you can read that, but the top right one, it's, there's no outside arrow coming into that one, it's a private component, uh, whereas the Power DNS server and the, the uh, nameless registration component, they are public ones, so they are, uh, you know, external things are allowed to call it. Right. So I'm going to show you some, some views, uh, some, some screenshots of what systems that looks like. I was thinking about doing a live demo, but I'm too chicken. Um, so like main features, I would say, are uh, just you know, having somewhere where you can find, it, find out information about components and even just list components. Uh, do dependency tracking, so we can see for a given component, which other components does it call and which components call it. In some cases, we can see that. Uh, there's also things about managing deployments uh, in, in various ways, uh, and very importantly, ownership and alerting. So, like, who owns a component is a, a question that very often needs answering. Um, here's a. I think this is probably not going to be very. Wow, it's not too bad. So, <coughs> that's the, the component overview page. Again, uh, later on, if you download the slides, you will be able to see what's there. Uh, but it basically shows you know this. There's um, uh, a few tabs at the top. We have now selected the overview tab, and there are some other ones. And then there are some different sections, with uh, the main one on the, in the middle left being um, just you know, general data, key value pairs, basically. Uh, if we zoom in on the bottom right part, that's uh, an interesting thing. It's uh, dependency tracking. So this, uh, for this particular service, it has a lot of dependencies, which is stuff that it calls. Uh, and uh, so things to say about that is you, you can see that two of them are orange. That means that the, uh, the people, the, the squad that owns these things have marked them as private or haven't marked them as public. Private is the default. Uh, and this service is still calling them and is owned by a different squad. So that's some kind of warning saying something is not right here. Maybe those services should actually be noted as public or you're doing something wrong. So, like, raising a flag, and then hopefully people will talk and, and work it out. Um, uh, maybe you can read it, probably not. It's, you see there are two words there saying declared and runtime at the right of each component. <coughs> that means that uh, we have uh, more or less sophisticated de runtime detection systems that actually track, like, what are the outgoing calls that services make? Which other services do they call? Uh, and then we, then we collect that data from each instance, and then we see, okay, what does it look like? And we also you know, recommend that people should, uh, should declare, I'm going to use these services, and then we can compare. Like, if they're not using a service, why do they think they would be? And if they're calling a service they didn't think they would be using, is that, does that make sense? So in this case, it's all, all good. Like, all of the services that it's calling are, are uh, declared, and they're also detected at runtime. That's why all of the, the dots are green, otherwise there would be orange dots there. And, and the mouse over a tooltip saying, you know, this is wrong. Um, right. And, and based on this information, we can actually build up, you know, uh, we have a, like something that, that creates uh, graph as files and that's included in the UI. The screenshot I showed you is, is old. Nowadays, this is like uh, on the, on the uh, it's right there. So uh, like a system map, and this is the, auto-generated version of um, uh, the architecture diagram I showed you a couple of slides ago. So it shows the nameless system at top and, and some of the components that are in there. Um, and it also shows like what are the things that are calling in to, to nameless registry, in this case in particular. Right. Deployment. Uh, on the front page, on the overview page, you can see uh, where uh, your service is deployed and what version is deployed if you provide that information in your, uh, in your build. So in this case, there are 76 instances of search view, version 02.74. Um, <coughs> and you can actually click on that link and then you'll see all of the machines where it's running. So you can know that. Um, if depending on, on what you're using, if you're using Helios, uh, which is our uh, open-sourced uh, container orchestration system, 
and you're in Spotify and you do various things, then you can manage, manage deployments via systemz. So uh, like for each host, you can see what's, what's the version that's running, and then you can you know, update or, or change your, uh, what's, what's running where. <coughs> um, we have a concept that we call pods, which is like a data center. And, and if your service isn't running in all the data centers, then you can change. You can say, if somebody wants to look it up in data center A, then send him to B. Uh, if somebody's looking it up in B, well, there are instances running there, so you know, you're good. Right. <coughs> and then there's something about the ownership information. Uh, you won't be able to see this either. But basically, it shows uh, you know, who, what squad is owning it, and hopefully some sort of contact method. So there, in this case, there's a link to Slack, and you can click on it, and then you'll be sent to their Slack channel, and you can ask them a question if, if there's any. If you have registered a PagerDuty key, uh, that's the red box. There's no PagerDuty key there because I removed it. Uh, but if it's there, uh, then uh, you can see if there's a currently uh, an alert for that service. So if, if, you know, if, if it has problems, then you can see that. So if your service is failing, then you can find out, OK, it's failing because of this downstream dependency I have. It's not working. Or if the service isn't working, the downstream that you don't own, uh, then you can click on the bullhorn and wake the guys up who own it and say, you're broken, you're breaking me, please wake up and fix it. And in addition to this, you can do lots of other stuff. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about these things. I just, I'm just going to note that, that System Z has, in, in the short time that it's lived, it's become a little bit of a, of a Swiss Army knife. So it's like the default place to put features in when, when that relate to managing stuff. And, and um, uh, I have some suspicion that that may not be great in the long run. It's not bad right now, but we'll see. We'll probably have to do some, some cleaning up or some sort of structuring around this as we go along. <coughs> so how did we build this? Um, let's first talk a little bit about the data model. Uh, and it's always funny, I think, when you look at, at or, or when you have things like this. It, it, this took us, I think, about three months to come up with. And it's, you know, four boxes and some lines. Uh, so it, it's amazing how, how long you can spend on, on thinking about something that looks super trivial when you're done. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so it, it's the, the core data looks like this. And then in, in addition to that, you, know, you heard me talking about things like PagerDuty key and so on, and, and Slack channel ID. That's not reflected here. It's like additional stuff that, that, that can be added to the model. But this is like a core data model. Um, <coughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the things that are here. We have like at the top, there's a system. And the system obviously can contain multiple components, right? It's also the case that a component can only belong to one system, uh, the way we, we model it. Um, then a component, if we go take the, the down arrow first to the squad. Uh, so a squad very obviously can own many components. There are 1,100 components and 100 squads, so obviously that has to be the case. The interesting thing is it's also it's a many-to-many -many relationship because of the way that we're growing by cell division. Uh, it, and sometimes, you know, squads can't make up their minds about who should own component X. Like, is it them or them? Well, both of them, and until we work it out. So that's like an ad adaptation to the reality that we have at Spotify, uh, you know, where, where we have we had to do it this way, and it's it's working. Um, then there are two links t between component and discover name, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But um, so a, a component has you know, it can register. Uh, oh, let's let's do the other one first. Uh, a component pretty obviously can call multiple other services, so it'll dis depend on uh, multiple other discover names. That's that's not surprising, and it's also not surprising that, you know, if there is a service, then it can be called by many other services. So the depends on uh, relationship down there, it's many to many. Uh, and then there's the registers. Like a component can register a discover name, which means that this is a name that if you look up that name, you'll find me. And, and a component can have many names. So it's like aliases uh, of some kind. And what's interesting is that it's that relationship is also many to many. So more than one component can be discoverable through the same name. And why is that? This is why. Uh, so so uh, 
uh, it's maybe a slight detour, but I think it's interesting. It's um, the, the, the I'm going to walk you through the, the the current migration plan that the Zool Squad has in uh, at, at Spotify, and the Zool, the Zool Squad they own our, our user database and our, our login systems, so it's uh, it's obviously a very critical uh, piece of infrastructure. If if that goes down, then people can't log into Spotify, and 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 that's really bad. We don't want that to happen. <coughs> it's also something that obviously takes you know there's there's a lot of uh, volume, uh, traffic volume, so uh, there's a lot of requests to it. And uh, so this diagram shows, you know, clients on the one hand, and on the, uh, the other side there's user two. Can you see that? Yeah? Uh, user two is the service, and it's exposing itself or it's registering two discover names, uh, user two and login. Uh, and, and the reason is that login handles login, and user two handles other um, user-related things. So and the fact that we're registering them separately means we can scale them differently. So uh, some instances of the user two service will register only the login interface uh, or login uh, discovery name, and some others will only register user two. And, and the user two part is about reading and setting different uh, user attributes. So is this a premium subscriber? Is it not? And you know, these things. <coughs> so what what they want to do is they want to get to a state like this. They want to split user two into three different new services. User three, which will handle login, uh, attributes, which is about reading and setting attributes, and uh, a create users service, which handles uh, creating new users. How do they do that without downtime? This is their plan. They're going to start by uh, having user two register another discover name, user two legacy. Obviously, no incoming traffic for that, but if there were any, it would be there. Then they will build a new service called user to proxy, and it will uh, just delegate all of its requests to user to legacy, and then you know send responses back, just proxying through. But it's not getting any traffic because it doesn't have any discovered names. So they fix that by having user to proxy registering user to and login. So now we have the situation where two services, two components, are registering the same discover names. What does that mean? It means that for a client that does a lookup of user two, there is you know uh, not a 50/50, but you know an, uh, uh, a chance that they will get a direct reference to user two and call that, or they will go to user two proxy, which will send them to user two legacy, which will send them to user two. And things will work. Like eventually, requests will be served by user two, and you know the right responses will be sent, and, and things will work. Next step is to tell user two to no longer register these uh, discover names. So all of the traffic goes through the proxy. Okay. And then they start building the other services, and then register them under some discover names. Uh, and at at some point. When they are, you know, ready enough with uh, with those other services, they can start having the proxy also send requests through to these other new discovery names. And this is really uh, extremely useful, right? Because what they can do then is they can send through only one percent of the requests, or even less than that. So they can validate, you know, performance and scalability constraints and make sure that that works. And since they have a, a common point in user two proxy. Where you know, so they can actually send requests both ways, wait for both responses, compare them, see that things are as they should be, and only then uh, send things back. Um, once they are happy with the way that the new services perform, clients can start making direct calls to them. Uh, and if they want to at this stage or even before, oops, what did I do now? And then, uh, yeah, so uh, I can't come back because of things work. So if they wanted to at this stage, they could, they could also turn off like uh, the forwarding to user two legacy. When, once they're happy with the new services, they do everything as they should. Or they can wait until there are no more clients that call user two and login. And this, this is what we're seeing now. And when they're here, they can just remove all of that part. And they're done. Uh, so no downtime. 
and the uh, the confidence that the that things are just going to work because you can validate both that the responses from the new and the old systems are the same and that the new systems can all can handle the the, the performance requirements so that's like a, an example of, of uh, how we utilize the fact that services register themselves with discover names that are different from their own names and that they can have you know uh, that, that it's a many-to-many -many relationship cool so <coughs> Here's another slide that you can't read. Um, I say that with a bit of pride. Um, the point of this, I mean, obviously look at, look at it when you, when you get the slides and can download them if you're interested. But the point of this is mostly to show how the, the architecture of, of System Z is. It's um, uh, an, an Angular user interface with Angular modules for the different uh, components. So it's, it's modular from the get-go. and uh, the yellow boxes are uh, represent the teams. So different teams own different parts of the UI and different backing uh, backend services. So see the uh, the green things are, are UIs, and then there's like Helios and Nameless, which are, are systems or services backend services. So System Z is uh, is of course like it's uh, it's a microservices based thing. Uh, so it's like a meta thing. Um, let's see. So one one thing to note here is is uh, the sys model component. I wish I had a pointer. I don't. Yeah, if you see the the big uh, the big square blob right below it, there's something called sys model, which has a lot of errors coming into it, and that's a service that's uh, providing all of the data that we're using. So uh, you saw the key values that come up there, the, the Slack channel and, and these things, the pager duty key. That all uh, lives in, in YAML files uh, in, uh, in source repositories, and it's served by, by this sysmodel service. So anything that needs data, uh, you know, systems metadata to, to work, it'll call sysmodel. And um, so we have YAML files, uh, which have, you know, very loose or, or like multiple schemas, I would say. Uh, part of the schema is the, the 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 core model that I described earlier with component system and discovery name squad um, or or owner and, um, um, and and in addition to that there's like you know multiple other schemas where uh, different features in in system Z add their own data so for for the page duty integration all it needs is the page duty key that's a key value thing that lives in in a section of this YAML file the um, um, yeah, and so on, and, and then the deployment system also has like its own uh, configuration that goes in there, and so on. The um, uh, yeah, the the files live with the code, so uh, that was a design decision that we made that we want to make sure that you know we don't want to put this into a database that is owned by somebody else. We want it to live together with the code that the team owns. Um, because of uh, you know, partly because of this, like um, we have a lot of really dirty data uh, in in our in our system, and the reason, one reason is is that the owners don't benefit from from the quality of their their metadata directly. Like if uh, it's people that need to find out about your service that benefit from it, you don't benefit it from it yourself. So you know. Maybe you're not so motivated. It's like keeping a comment up to date. Like you're, you're changing the code, comments maybe update them if you're well behaved. Maybe not. Um, plus the uh, the fact that we have a, a rapidly changing organization. You know, cell division, people moving, uh, ownership moving because like this squad shouldn't own that anymore, and so on. And uh, we also have pretty rapidly evolving infrastructure. So uh, I mentioned Apollo before, which is our, our, our backend uh, framework. Um, we have you know, other versions of that as well, Python-based and, and, and other things. So we have that, that leads to runtime computation, because you know, we collect a lot of data uh, at runtime. But since we have, uh, right now, we have about 34 different container versions running in production. Uh, so obviously, they can return. They have different capabilities and can return different kinds of data. They, some of them cannot provide any at all. Some can provide uh, information about outgoing calls. Some can provide about incoming calls. And you know. so we have dirty data. We don't have all the data everywhere. Um, also, um, 
the um, the rapid growth and the rapid changes often lead to people not being very knowledgeable about stuff that they own. So, um, so, so that's another you know thing that makes it hard to find out uh, information about things. Also, ownership information might might not be updated. A squad might be divided, new squads created, uh, and nobody updates uh, any of the information. So it's pointing to like a, a dead squad which doesn't exist anymore. So that's one of the constraints that we have in, in, our, uh, in our system design. So so we have, like, throughout um, our, our work with Systems Ed, we've, we've been doing quite a lot of things to, to encourage people to, you know, do stuff and, and keep the state up to date. So we have the the warnings, which is some, you know, some kind of gamification, because if you're a developer, then you, you want your things to be to look really clean, and if you go and look at it in System Z, then there are some warnings there, and you know, hopefully there will be some, some itch and make people fix stuff. Uh, the, we also did this, which I think was really pretty fun. Like this is, was printed on A3 uh, papers and and taped to all of the toilet wall, the toilet doors uh, at Spotify. Ten things you didn't know about System Z that will amaze you. Migrating is super easy. You can create a new service and, uh, and use any Jenkins instance, and so on. And number 10, you can give the tools team, that's the squad that built System Z, feedback and suggest new features via Slack or email. Amazing stuff. Um, cool. So that's that. Um, Coming up to the conclusion, like or, or, or the uh, the wrap up of this talk, what's what's been the impact? Like what's what's happened uh, when we did this? So it, it's hard to know, uh, obviously, but we can see that we have, you know, ba based on statistics that we're collecting in the user interface, we have about 200 uh, in the unique users uh, every week, uh, and about 400 every month, out of about 800 people in. TPD, which is short for technology, product, and, and development, um, technology, product, and design. Um, so that's, you know, but that's maybe a little bit irrelevant because some things you have to do through System Z, so they, you can't avoid logging in. But you know, people use it. We think that's good. Um, an interesting thing as well is that uh, if you remember back to the, to the diagram where we had like a bunch of infrastructure squads. So building tools to support the feature squads. And these infrastructure squads are autonomous. They build their own things independently. Uh, and that meant, or has meant before, that you know, they, they create their own user interfaces and their own admin tools, and then they live on some URL somewhere, and people don't know where they are. So the fact that there is now a, like a common point in System Z has made it easier for, for feature squads or feature developers to find the stuff that they need, because they can go there. Another interesting thing is that it has also we've noticed that it leads to teams uh, building related features, so infrastructure teams building related features. Like uh, an example is the the team that owns hardware and provisioning, and the team that owns uh, DNS infrastructure, and the team that owns System Z. Together, have built like an improved version of how you do provisioning and, and deployment. Uh, so, teams that have that own related features start talking to, to each other about how to build them and making, making the UIs more consistent and the features better for the, for the end users. And um, we, uh, every year uh, since 2014, we've been doing like a survey in, among the, the developers in New York. That's about 150, I think, uh, developers at Spotify's New York office. And they don't have as much infrastructure uh, there. Most of our IO is, is here, or our infrastructure operations teams are here in Stockholm. So there's a, like a yearly survey about what sucks about Spotify's infrastructure. And in, in 2015, ServiceDB, the predecessor, showed up as, you know, I think number three in what sucks. Whereas now in 2016, uh, System Z is one of the things that gets the most frequent. It's great, even though we're actually asking them what sucks. So that's good. It's also become a Swiss Army knife. It's doing a lot of different things. Um, I think the jury is still out on whether that's a good thing or not. Um, but it's, it's uh, becoming the default place to go where you, when you want to uh, create a tool for, for, for feature, for backend developers. Yeah. 
I should also say that that only it's only last week or something or, or two weeks ago that the um, uh, people building uh, components in on the client side, so like the different apps and, and tools in, in the client side, they they also started thinking about using System Z to track their stuff. So it might be that we have all of all of Spotify uh, tracked in the same system at some point, maybe. So to conclude, if you have microservices at scale, whatever scale means, it means you have a lot of small things. Each one is, is easy to understand individually, but the combination is hard. Uh, like, how? what's the big picture? What are even the things that you have? Like what's the, where do you have a list of them somewhere? So, so if you have metadata, then, uh, then, then uh, you know, that helps you understand the system. At least at Spotify, we have very dirty metadata. I, I don't have you know, enough information to say that that's a, a fact of nature. I think it is. I think it's very likely that that's going to be the case almost anywhere. Um, and, and the way the, the fact that we, you know, uh, it may be obvious, but it's not obvious at Spotify that, that the fact that you know we in, in the, the infrastructure squads are uh, actually providing a single user interface for you know all of our customers is actually helping um, helping us make uh, better better tools and helps uh, our users uh, because they can uh, use more consistent tools. Right, and that's all I had. Do you have any questions? This one over there. Um, hi, how do you collect runtime information about dependencies? How do we collect runtime information about dependencies? Yeah. Right, so um, <coughs> we have, uh, I mentioned Apollo, that's, that's our framework for, for like building backend services. And uh, to make a, a fairly long story short, Apollo tracks that information. So whenever you're making a, a call, it registers the discover name that you're calling to. And then, you know, and, and then uh, there's a, a metadata endpoint that you can query on every service, which will tell you, I have made calls to these services or, or these discovery names. It also includes other information such as, you know, what's my current configuration? What's, uh, if you provided it in your build, like what's the, the version number and, and, you know, these things. More questions? There is some overlap in what you have done with uh, other vendors, for example, the cloud providers and also the Netflix OSS stack. Um, could you elaborate on the key features that you needed that were not provided elsewhere? Apart from culture, I think the volume is a little bit low because I'm having to elaborate on the key features that we that you felt that you needed that were not provided, for example, by the Netflix right. OSS stack. So, like, why didn't we pick a, an out-of-the-box solution for this? Yes, I think the um, the, the the answer is mostly that it's uh, the System Z is is like it's very much not a candidate for open sourcing or something like that. It's uh, everything underneath it is very much like. Spotify in specific infrastructure. So um, I don't know that we did any very serious consideration of whether we could sort of fit some external tool, did we? Not really, yeah. So basically we, we, we didn't think that it would be feasible to, to retrofit like an external tool and uh, because, because there's so much custom stuff like from, uh, and, and we, we didn't, we, I said we started building this a year and a half ago. And that's the, the user interface part. Like the things about uh, registering metadata and, and tracking configurations, and th these things had been in existence for, for a long time. Um, so we actually had to, you know, we had some stuff out there that we knew we wanted to be able to track. And, uh, and it just felt, you know, the easy thing to do is to, 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 to collect these things and, you know, make them available in a UI. Any more questions? I don't see any. Here. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so w what's the size you would say uh, in terms of people? At what po uh, at which point, point you would uh, consider switching to a microservice architecture? Because 
I would say that if you start and you're a really small team, then microservices are, you know, they're a big overhead in some ways. So since you scaled up, what kind of size did you reach? Hmm. Good question. So <coughs> um, I don't know that I have a, a really good answer, but I think, uh, I think you're onto something when you're saying that it's very much about the size of the team. Like, I think sometimes you hear, if you look at the scale cube, it, it only has like these three dimensions, which is you know, the scaling of your hardware or your software, like the system. But I, I think one of the big benefits of having a microservice architecture is that it's much easier to parallelize development on the services. And you can obviously do things like deployment individually and so on, which is harder for us when we're looking at the clients. And the clients are not microservices based. They are like you know, a bunch of teams that have to combine their effort and put that into one monolith. Really. So, um, but if I would guess, you know, five teams, six, that's when it might, well, there might be some kind of inflection point where it might start paying off. Any more questions? No? All right, then thank you so much.